Greetings on behalf of Naropa University and the Wisdom Traditions Department. I'm delighted to introduce you to Pierre Nathanael Miles Yepes and this program, Sufism and the Religion of Love. Over the course of this weekend, you will be hearing stories, poetries, teachings, all about love and transformation from the Sufi tradition, as well as contemplative practice of remembrance, zikr. I'm so delighted to introduce Nathanael. He's a very dear colleague. He's part of our department here at Wisdom Traditions. And he also has a long list of accomplishments. He's the head of the Anayati Maimuni Order of Sufism, co-founder of the Karis Foundation and the Heartfire Festival, in which he's a leading figure and thinker in interspirituality and new monasticism. He's also an author of many books, most recently, in the Tea House of Experience, Nine Talks on the Path of Sufism. He's also an accomplished artist, but if that wasn't enough, he's also a beloved professor here at Naropa in our department where he teaches contemplative Islam, Sufism, religion and mystical experience, and a newly designed course on interspiritual dialogue. So I'm so honored and so delighted to introduce you and for you to be leading this weekend. And I wonder if you might be able to share with us a little bit what our participants might be able to experience and expect in this weekend. What are we going to be doing? So when I accepted the, uh, the idea of giving these talks, I thought it was a great opportunity to talk about Sufism. Uh, Sufism is, is a tradition that is underrepresented in the United States, but has so much to offer. Um, because Sufism is a tradition that, whereas you might say that uh, Buddhism um, uses as its tool the mind, in Sufism we use love as a tool, as a tool of transformation of consciousness. And so I thought it was a good opportunity to talk about Sufism as the religion of love. And that's a, a phrase that is used in Sufism. Um, among Sufis, we memorize definitions of what it is to be a Sufi as a practice, and we repeat them to ourselves to uh, remind us of what it is we're doing on this path. And so one of those simple definitions is Sufism is the religion of love. What does the religion of love look like? So we're going to begin to talk a little bit about how Sufism uses love as a technology for transforming consciousness. Uh, both through the practice of zikr, which is a kind of mantric practice, um, repeating particular phrases that uh, engage us with those energies of love. But then we'll also look at particular teachings that show how, how we engage love in life can shift our consciousness. And so that's a lot of what we'll be doing this weekend and talking about. And I'll use uh, some of a, a new book that I've written as text so that we can go through that together. Thank you. So I hope you will join us. If you are joining us uh, for the Friday evening, I really encourage you to sign up for the entire weekend. And if you are a Naropa student taking this for credit, please be sure to check in in your Canvas course and follow the syllabus. And I'm really looking forward to you joining us in this wonderful weekend. Thank you. So I'd like to tell a story. Um, this is a story I learned from my teacher who found it in a medieval uh, Kabbalistic text. The interesting thing is it's a Sufi story, but was found in a Kabbalistic text. So very interesting origins. And the story goes like this. Once in some long-forgotten sultanate of the East, there dwelled a group of young men who liked to hang out in the souk. The souk is the open market in the Middle East, which might be near the gates of the palace. And this group of young men were the kind of young men that hadn't quite found their way yet, most of them not really looking for a way. And so they basically hung out in the open market. 
And to get by, they didn't really have homes. Uh, to get by, they would do a little work in the souk in the open market and make enough money to get a little food to eat and maybe to gamble with at night, go to sleep at night, and the next day they get up and do the same thing. A few odd jobs, a little money, a little gambling, a little food, day after day. So after a while, this gets pretty boring. And so one day, they're kind of laying against the walls of the palace, bored, a little more bored than usual. And one of them, more bored than the others, is kind of staring off into the distance. And as he's looking out into the distance, out into the open road, he sees a little dust cloud, you know? the kind of dust cloud that announces somebody is coming. And so he's just watching it and watching it. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger until he sees what it is. It is a sedan chair, you know, the kind of chair that, you know, four big men will carry on two big staves on their shoulders and there'll be a little structure on there with drapery. And it's the kind of chair that carries the women of the court. So, you know, this is the best spectacle going, so he's watching. And the sedan chair comes up right to the gate to the palace. And then he sees a sight such as he's never seen before. The most lovely young woman that he's ever seen. Not like the girls of the souk. She seems a rare and radiant pearl. And he drinks her face in and she steps down gently and beautifully arrayed and then passes through the gates of the palace. And in a blink, she's gone. But there he is, standing, staring, mouth agape, still seeing the vision of her in his eyes. And as he's standing there staring, lost in thought, he suddenly feels Somebody smacks his back and there's raucous laughter. All his buddies are watching at him there with his mouth slack and now laughing at him and he's embarrassed. And he finally turns around and he says, what I wouldn't give for two hours alone with her. And now they laugh with him, you know, kind of coarse joke. And, and they, they walk off arm in arm and, and this is the kind of jokes they make and, you know, and he's not much different than them. He's now enlisted them, you know, in, in laughing about the same things. But unlike them, he turns and looks back over his shoulder. That night as he's laying in his little shelter, you know, arms behind his head, looking up at the stars, he thinks of the young woman, the princess. And he can't think about anything else. And it's bothering him that he can't stop thinking about her. So after a sleepless night, he gets up again, still preoccupied with her, and goes back to the gates of the palace, hoping to catch sight of her again. Spends all day there, no sign of her. She doesn't come out. He goes back the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and He's kind of like, clearly obsessed, <laughs> but, but he's kind of like, you know, he's, he's getting thinner. He's not eating as much. He's not hanging out with his friends. He's bothered by his own preoccupation with her. And finally, he's like, shake it off, man. You know, like you got to come out of this. And he's realizing that those, those preoccupations of the past, the gambling with buddies and the running around chasing different girls in the market, the, the allure is worn off. Now he thinks only of her. And he's like, what's happened to my life? So finally he's like, okay, I'm gonna go back to my life, the, enough of this, this obsession, I've gotta get back and find my life again. And he decides to go hard at it, you know. He goes and finds his buddies. They, they make a lot of money during the day. They go out and party at night. They gamble, they drink. He even chases other young women who are easier to catch than the elusive princess. 
And he does this for a few days, and no, he's got no taste for it anymore. He gives in, gets his lawn chair or whatever, and goes back to the gates of the palace, sits at the door. And he waits and waits until one day, just dozing, he catches sight of a little dust cloud off in the distance, watches it get bigger, and indeed, there's the sedan chair again. And he watches them come up, and he's like, this is my moment. This is it. Now he's brushing himself off. He's getting ready. What's he going to do? He's going to proclaim his love because, right, that's all that's necessary. I'll proclaim my love. She'll love me. And it happily ever after. Because like many young men, he thinks that the depth of his own feelings suggests hers. So he's waiting, you know, gets in his stance and waits for them to set the chair down. The chair sets down and then he does something unwise. He leaps at the chair just as the curtains open and she steps down and he lands in front of her and grabs the hem of her dress and kisses it and says, my love, when can we be together? You can imagine the princess is taken aback, but with royal cool, she gathers herself, looks down at this ragged young man, and says, in the cemetery, which is to say, not in this lifetime, buddy. And so the next thing he knows, he's being grabbed by rough hands and launched, and she enters the gates of the palace. And he hits the ground, rolls, and when he gets up, a smile, ear to ear. In the cemetery, the dead have no eyes. My beloved is smart as well as beautiful. I'll go to the cemetery. And so he rushes off to the outskirts of town, ready to meet her in the cemetery, passes through the gates, and immediately starts to search the cemetery for the most advantageous place for their encounter. And so he looks in this corner, that corner, in front of this headstone and that, and nothing is good enough. By every measure he can conceive, he's trying to find the most advantageous place for making love in the cemetery. And finally, he can't figure out a better spot than this one particular headstone with a beautiful uh, piece of grass in front of it, and so he sits down and waits. A few hours pass, and he's like, it might not be so easy for her to get out of the palace, I guess. You know, I bet, I bet her father, the sultan, watches her like a hawk. I had to wait weeks in front of the gates of the palace. I might have to wait just as long here. He settles in. He's afraid to leave the cemetery because he's already learned that lesson. He left the gates of the palace to party for a few days, and she must have come out in that time. And so he's missed her. He's not going to miss her again. He's going to stay in the cemetery. A few days pass. He's very hungry. He goes to the edge of the cemetery, begs a little food from people. People give it. It's a, it's a generous culture. Brings it back to his headstone, eats. More days pass, and he's bored. So he starts to wander around his new home, the cemetery. He reads headstones, and he sees, oh, this one died pretty young. Oh, this one lived to old age. This one, you know, seems to have died in an accident. He hears over, overhears people talking, you know, like, oh, so-and-so died this way. They died of a a childhood sickness. They died in a, a cart accident. And so he hears all these stories. People come to the cemetery to, to, to bury their loved ones and to visit their loved ones. And he listens to their conversations. And he hears statements like this. Oh, she was so beautiful when she was young. 
Oh, my husband, he was so handsome. You should have seen him. And he thinks about this. And he thinks, what is it I've fallen in love with in my princess? Surely she'll age too and end up in the cemetery, just bones eventually. Her beauty will fade. Will I love her when she's no longer so beautiful? But these people, they come, you know, and they've buried their loved ones, and they've lived whole lives together beyond the beauty of their youth, and they still seem to love them. Will I love the princess when she's not so beautiful? And this becomes a meditation for him. Like, like, what is this all about, this beauty thing? What is the source of beauty? What is the source of love? How does beauty inspire love? What is the connection between these things? Is there a beauty that doesn't change? What is the source of that beauty? And being a good Muslim boy, he thinks, well, that must be God. God must be the source of beauty and the source of love. Is God beautiful? What is the beauty of God like? And so he thinks on these things. But try as he might, he cannot come up with an image of how beautiful God must be. Whenever he thinks of it, he sees the lovely pearl-like face of the princess. He can't imagine a more beautiful thing than her. But he's trying. Because it's, it's a question. What does this mean? And so he starts to try to gather an idea of what this beauty of God must be. And so he summons up all the images of beauty that he can imagine, that he's, every beautiful thing he's ever seen, the jasmine flowers and the tall cypresses that reach the sky, the sky itself, the image of his beloved in the sky, a silhouette, a, an ethereal form floating there, and his thought of her and his love of her, all encompassed in one great vision of the source of all beauty. And he passes out in utter bliss. <clears throat> While he's been there through the weeks in these meditations, people start to notice him. And it's not terribly unusual to see somebody like this in the cemetery because in, in this period, it's a time of penitence. And you might pass a cemetery and see somebody in it, maybe with a Sufi tespi. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, roaming around the cemetery and reciting names of God and sometimes it's understood that these people are penitents. They're, they have something in their lives for which they feel great guilt or shame, and they need to expiate that guilt. And so sometimes a person would go to the cemetery and meditate there as a kind of penance. And so people think, oh, this is a guy who must have done a bad thing, and now he's trying to clean it up. And that's seen as a worthy thing to do. And so people leave a little food for him and feed him while he's there because he's doing this great expiation of his guilt. <clears throat> but as time goes on and they see him sitting in front of his, uh, his, his favored spot for making love, this tombstone behind him, and looking thoughtful, I think, maybe he's not a penitent. Maybe he's a sage, a holy man. And now they really begin to bring food offerings. And every once in a while, he'll look up from his meditation, and there's food. He's grateful for it, eats, goes on thinking his deep thoughts. And the truth is, he's becoming a thoughtful person. He looks at things, he thinks about them, he considers their origins and their depths, considers uh, consequences for behaviors. And now, 
he might notice a little plate of food is left for him and he looks up and somebody's standing there expectantly. And he says, yes. And somebody might say, Mola, Master, I'm dealing with a thing in my life. You know, there's not enough money to marry off my daughter. Uh, the crops aren't good. They ask him questions. And he says, really? Let me think about that. Come back tomorrow and we'll talk about it. And they come back and he has thoughtful things to say and they like to talk to him. Sometimes they come with great pain and their pain squeezes and breaks his heart. And he says, may there be help for you. And somehow those words seem to help as if he's giving them a blessing. Beard is growing long, he's looking more and more the part. Meanwhile, off at the palace, the princess has been married off in uh, a marriage of diplomacy. So she does what princesses do, she does her duty. She's married to the son of uh, another sultan as a way of making peace between the two uh, sultanates, the two kingdoms. And while this can be a bad situation for her, it's not so bad. He's a decent young man, and they make the best of their life together. They grow fond, they grow a relationship, they care about one another, and her life is pretty good. As far as the life of a princess goes, she's pretty happy. The great sorrow of her life is that she doesn't get pregnant. And when she does get pregnant, the pregnancy doesn't hold. So she should get a month in and she loses the child, if she gets pregnant at all. And for her, this is a great desire of her life, to have a child, and in that society, a lot of, a lot of her idea of herself was bound up with the idea of being able to have a child. And this becomes the great sorrow of her life because she has all these resources at her disposal. They bring the best doctors. They have the best doctors already at the palace. He can't do anything for her. They send away for the best doctors from other regions. They all come in, in, in a train and nobody can help her. She goes to charlatans for every little potion. Nothing works. Medicine people, everything. Finally, she's in despair. And one day her maid, seeing her in this deep despair, says, my princess, it's not my place, but I have to say something. When we, the people of this, this city, when we have such a need, we go to the cemetery. And there's a great saint in the cemetery. And we tell him our need, and he gives a blessing, and the blessings work. And, and the princess says, I have to go see him. Well, you can't go dressed as yourself. We'll change clothes, and you'll go in my maid's clothes, and she'll go accompanied by the guards of the court towards evening, when nobody will spot her. So it's dark, or getting dark in the cemetery, and the saint of the cemetery is sitting there looking thoughtful, long beard now, a sage, and he senses that somebody's standing in front of him. And he looks up, and a young woman says, Mola, master. And he says, my princess, you've kept your promise. And now she's startled. She looks at her clothing. How could you know it's me? And he says, because I'm the young man you told to, to meet in the cemetery. 
You've kept your promise. In all these long years, I've waited for you with your face before me. And I need to thank you. In my life here, I found a different me. I found a me that looks deep into matters and I've learned great things. I've learned about the source of beauty and the source of my own love for you. And I'm grateful, thank you. But princess, no one comes to me happy. They all come in pain. What is your pain? And then she begins to cry and she says, all these years I've been trying to conceive a child. And she tells the whole story of how she's tried everything until she was sent to him. And he's, as he hears her story, his heart breaks for her. And he realizes he's still in love with the princess. And in the end, he says, if there's been any merit in this life that I've led in this cemetery and all the pain that I've heard and the good things I've tried to tell people and help with, if there's been any merit in that, may it be transformed into a child for you. And with that, he lowers his head and continues to gaze on the source of his love. And she goes away. <clears throat> In the days that follow, people notice that the saint of the cemetery is in a deeper state of samadhi, as it were, <laughs> deeper meditation than usual. And they try to be respectful. They don't disturb him. They leave the food and they go away, thinking they'll come back another day. But as they come back other days, they see the food has not been touched and it's drying up and people become concerned and they start to gather until one bold person leans forward toward the saint of the cemetery and puts a, a little mirror under his nose to see if there's any breath there and there's no breath. He's died in his meditation gazing on the source of his love and the source of beauty. Meanwhile, meanwhile back at the palace, the princess becomes pregnant. And the pregnancy seems to be holding. But she's not telling anybody. She's cautious about it. She's worried. But it gets in a few months, and now she's gaining confidence. And she feels, no, the life is actually strong inside me. This is going to be good. And indeed, she gives birth to a healthy boy. And after the period is passed where it's safe enough to take the child out of the palace, she decides that she's going to take the child to see the saint of the cemetery for a blessing. And so she calls her maid and she says, get us dressed, we're, we're going to go see the saint of the cemetery. And the maid looks stricken. And she says, princess, has no one told you? The saint of the cemetery, I'm sorry to tell you, died shortly after you saw him. And now the princess genuinely mourns the saint of the cemetery. And she orders that in the spot that he occupied, that they erect a great uh, monument or kind of what they call a derga, you know, a, a, a burial place for a saint. And when her child is old enough, five or six years old, she takes him to the derga of the saint of the cemetery. And as they stand before it, she tells her boy the story of the love that made his birth possible. So Sufism is, is full of stories like this. This is a particularly good one. Um, but so much of its stories, so many, so many of its uh, teachings, its poetry, are all about the exploration of love and divine love. 
Sometimes they make a distinction between these things, eshki majazi and eshki hakiki, um, apparent love and true love. And we use different words in Sufism to talk about love. On the one hand, we have a word mahaba, mahaba, or the basic word hub. <laughs> and mahaba is kind of basic love, loving kindness, just whatever kind of love you might feel for your child, for a friend, for your partner, for parents. It's just basic love, even, even for your pet. And on the other hand, there's another kind of love called eshk. And eshk is passionate love, fiery love. Eshk is the kind of love that Sufis tend to talk about. But it's not exclusive or different from, in terms in kind, from mahaba. So mahaba is said to be born out of Marifa, which is a word for knowledge. But knowledge is of two types also. There's knowledge as information, that's ilm. And that's just the words in a book, you know, the assemblage of ideas. It's information. That's not the kind of knowledge we're interested in, not on the spiritual path. On the spiritual path, we're interested in Marifa, experiential knowledge, or gnosis, the inner knowledge. And, and that's sometimes considered secret knowledge, but it's also just the knowledge of taste, zok. You've touched something, you've tasted something, you have a kind of knowledge about it that you can't unknow. And it's not the same as what you've written, read in a book or heard somebody say. You've tasted it. It's a tasted wisdom. And that's what we say Sufism is. The hikmat al zokia the tasted wisdom. And so, from marifa, we get love. So that's to say there's no love without knowledge, experiential knowledge. And and you might ask, well, well how do you account for, you know, those that strange phenomenon that sometimes happens that's almost love of, at first sight. And, and the Sufis will say it's because you've, you've glimpsed something. You've seen beneath the surface and glimpsed, glimpsed something deeper, and that's a taste of the deeper. And out of that knowledge, you can begin to fall in love. And so we say knowledge gives birth to love, but love is greater than knowledge. <clears throat> so this mahabha is good, but we'd call it kind of baseline love. And baseline love is kind of the best love. It's consistent. It's just always there. Eshk, on the other hand, fiery love, passionate love. Um, it comes from a root um, that is connected with another word called uh, ashaka. Ashaka is like bittersweet. Any, do you know what bittersweet is? It's like the vine that will wrap around a tree, almost strangling it. That's what ashaka is. It's a vine that strangles another something. And so eshk is said to come from ashaka. It's the kind of love that almost strangles by its passionate intensity. And in Sufism, they tend to celebrate eshk over mahaba. Because eshk is like a superpower that can be harnessed for transformation. But they exist in a kind of tension. They're not different in kind, as we said. You have a baseline of mahaba, and then eshk is like, you know, the peaks that rise above the baseline. And it might be um, similar to 
an ember and a flame. Mahaba is the ember. Eshk is when it's in flame. And the interesting thing is you don't really get an ember until there's already been a flame. Something is flamed up very hot and then you've got an ember. And in a relationship, an ember is very important because if you've got it, it can always be blown upon to create the flame again. And so, in love, when we're in the baseline periods of Mahabha, um, which is good, it's the kind of love you don't have to think about, it's just there. You don't have to question it. But it can get so quiet that it can be like background noise, you know, just And so much so that you get so used to that background noise that you, you think, wait, am I in love? And you can be fooled by that until something comes and threatens the love, and then it flames right back up. Your love is in danger or something else. There's troubles. And so Mahabha and Eshk exist in this tension. There are two different states of love. <clears throat> the Sufis celebrate Eshk, because when it's in flame, there's the possibility of transformation of consciousness. So, whereas in, say, Buddhism, you know, which uh, often is described as the graded path to enlightenment, everything is well organized, there are clear steps to progress through, and really, it's probably the best organized religion there is. And, and there's a great focus on mind and, and the logical progression that you can go through. And so that's its tool of transformation, how to utilize the mind. Sufism, on the other hand, sees love as its tool or lever of transformation. What if you could harness this power this willingness to do anything. It's a way of yielding the self for a purpose. When somebody is in love, they'll go to great lengths to serve another, even letting go of their own wants to serve the wants of someone else. And, and so this is kind of remarkable. Like, um, how often do we let go of our egos? And is there any good reason to let go of the ego? Because the ego does a job. It makes sure there's uh, shelter over your head, makes sure that there's food in your mouth. It takes care of the basic needs. It's got enough meanness and the importance of meanness to get those basic needs met. Make sure you got shelter, make sure you have food in your belly, make sure you're safe. That's what the ego does, that's what it's for. Problem is, it gets out of control. It's like more shelter, more food. You know, it just wants to keep acquiring until there's a treasury and you can never be unsafe again. It doesn't work and it's problematic and it becomes pathological. But it, in itself, it's good. It takes care of us. So in some, in some ways, you need a reason to let go of the ego and it better be a good reason. And when the reason is not good, it doesn't really work. The Sufis are observing love tends to be a reason that people yield ego or self, nafs, it's called in Sufism. Parents will give their own food to their children, love. You know. Oh, I see what you need is more important right now. Don't worry about me for the moment. You yield space. Observing this, Sufi said, how can we use that as a tool of transformation? And the tool is, uh, as it were, powered, charged, when it's in eshk, when love is in flame. And so, this is not the love of kind of dewy-eyed romantics. It's love that is charged and um, oh, even painful. 
it's because it's the, the, the love that comes to the level of obsession that, that really drives a person. It, it, rem, uh, it reminds me of the lines from the Song of Songs. In the Song of Songs, in the um, eighth chapter, it says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown it. For love is as strong as death, passion as cruel as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of God. Well, that's not dewy-eyed romance. And likewise, Rumi says, love is the flame, and the word that he's using there is eshk. So passionate love is the flame. Love is the flame which, when it blazes up, burns away everything except the beloved. There's just no room for anything but the beloved when love is in flame. Now, it may die down and it may flame back up, but in that moment, there's no room for anything else. No thought of anything else. That's, that's the young man obsessed. Like, he can't think of anything else. He can't, um, he has no taste for the worldly things anymore because this thing is in flame. Now, the big question for Sufis um, and the argument in early Sufism is what kind of love are we talking about? Divine love, this eshki hakiki, this true love, as it were, or something that they call eshki majazi, apparent love. And the people that use that terminology are on one side of the argument. So they're basically saying, the real love that we want to have is the love for God. And that love in relationships, and that's all apparent love. And that needs to be translated into love for God. And that's kind of uh, one group of Sufis of what's called the school of love, the Mazabi Ashk. Um, they would be the conservatives the orthodox, you know, just don't get into those relationship things. Just go out on the, on the roads and give your love to God. There's a much more radical group that's actually started the school of love. And they say there is no distinction between the love of another person and the love of God. And there's even, there's even a poem of Hafez uh, the great Persian poet, which, where he, he brings up this tension. He writes, To give up wine and human beauty, and to give up love, no, I won't do it. A hundred times I said I would. What was I thinking of? No, I won't do it. To say that paradise, its horries, its shade, are more to me than the dusty street before my lover's door? No, I won't do it. Basically, he's saying, as a Sufi, Hafiz has been told, give up this human love. I know you think you love her or him, but it's really not about that. It's about this you know, love for God. And he's wrestling with that. And he's like, I said I'd give up wine for metaphorical wine. I said, up, I, I said I'd give up you know, this love. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. Not for all the heavens, you know, all the treasures of heaven. I won't give it up. And that, that means somebody's telling him. Some Sufi teacher is telling him to do that. <clears throat> so there's this, there's this tension in Sufism over, you know, giving all this erotic energy to the divine and not di dissipating it in love relationships here. And that's what one school is saying, and the other part of the school is saying, no. Every bit of love that is experienced is itself divine. Because in what is called the Wadat al-Wajud, the unity of all being teachings of Sufism, which are our non-dual teachings, uh, there's nothing that's not God. So, ultimately, there's no love that is not ultimately offered to God. 
no love that you can have for anyone that is not given to God. It comes from God and it's given to God. And so this is the kind of thing we're going to talk about through the weekend. How the love that we can experience for one another in various types of relationship is ultimately given to God and serving to transform the self in such a way that we mature and deepen on the spiritual path. So within Sufism, there are a number of great sacred phrases that we repeat in the practice that's called zikr, remembrance. And one of these phrases is, Ishkallah Mabud Allah. Ishkallah Mabud Allah. Now, Ishk, as we've already talked about, is passionate love, love on fire. Ishkallah means, uh, in a simple way, God is love. But not just any love, God is Ishk passionate love, fiery love. The second part of the phrase is Mabud Allah, which is God is the beloved, Mabud. And when you put them together, Ishq Allah, Mabud Allah, which is like God love, God beloved, it's, it's like saying God is love, lover, and beloved. So, God is the lover, God is the object of love, the beloved, and God is the love between. So God is playing all the parts, love, lover, and beloved. And so this is the phrase in Sufism that we use to embody that kind of um, uh, non-dual ideal, realizing that it's only God loving God and God is really the love that goes between. And yet, where a lot of uh, non-dual teachings can feel very aloof, this is very active. It's celebrating the activity of the loving and the directing of love and the offering of, of love. And so it's a, it's a very passionate sort of zikr. And one of the ways we do it is with movement and so we might lean toward the left knee saying ishk and as we come back to center Allah ishk Allah and then leaning to the right mabud back to center Allah so that you see Allah becomes like the pole at the middle of it. In fact, it's not like two Allahs, it's Ishq Allah, Mabud Allah. And suggesting that God, because Allah just simply translates to God, God is the love and God is the beloved. Let's do a round of that together and remembering what the words mean. Ish. Allah, God love, Mabud, Allah, God beloved. Again, we'll do this on the Sufi Tespi, which is, you know, you know, these things get called a mala generally, but Tespi is the word that Sufis use. And Tespi means um, a tool of glorification, a glorifier literally. And a Sufi Tespi has 99 beads on it for the Asma al-Husna, the, the beautiful names of God, of which they're said to be 99. So it's broken into three segments of 33 with counter beads at the 33 mark. Kind of the shortest zikr a Sufi ever does is about 33. Be ashamed to do less. And you see 33s are multiples of 99. So. Sometimes they're broken into a, an 11 bead mala that you might wear around your wrist. So we'll do 99. 
of, of this particular zikr, this love-oriented zikr. Ishq Allah, Mabud Allah. And in Sufism, we emphasize the aesthetics of the words. And the aesthetics of the words are in, in what kind of feeling you put behind them. You know, you imagine talking about passionate love, like passionate love, you know, it's like falls flat. You say passionate love. And so it's, it's not eshk, it's eshk, you know, it's from the belly. You know, you gotta say it like you mean it. And there's a, um, there's a hadith, a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, um, uh, which says, um, God is beautiful and loves beauty. God is beautiful and loves beauty. And what this suggests to Sufis is that um, if God is beautiful and loves beauty, then beauty itself is a way into God. And so to do things beautifully, to make art, to, um, to enhance the aesthetics around your spiritual practice is a way of knocking on God's door. And you might expect it to be open because God loves beauty. And so there's, there's a kind of uh, aesthetic to Sufi uh, zikr practice. And it's in how we invest in it, in the beauty of the gestures and the investment in the words. So we'll do a round of Ishq Allah Mabood Allah. 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 Ishq Allah, Mabood Allah, 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 Ishq Allah, God love, Mabood Allah, God beloved, Ishq Allah, Mabood Allah, 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 Ishq, Allah, Mabood, Allah, Ishq, Allah, Mabood, Allah, Ishq, Allah, Mabood, Allah, Ishq, 
Allah, Mabud, Allah, Ish, 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 Allah, Mabud, Allah. Yashkallah, Mabud 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 Allah. Eshkalla mabudalla 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 Al.